epistle on this great solemnity of the Pentecost is from uh, the book of Acts. When the days of Pentecost were drawing to a close, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a violent wind blowing. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them parted tongues as of fire, which settled upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign tongues, even as the Holy Spirit prompted them to speak. Now they were staying at Jerusalem, devout Jews from every nation under heaven. And when this sound was heard, the multitude gathered and were bewildered in mind because each heard them speaking in his own language. But they were all amazed and marveled, saying, Behold, are not all these that are speaking Galileans? And how have we heard each his own language in which he was born? Parthian and Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus at, at Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the uh, parts of Libya about Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, Jews also, and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We've heard them speaking in our own languages of the wonderful works of God. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone love me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you've heard is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while yet dwelling with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your mind whatever I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled or be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I go away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would indeed rejoice <clears throat> that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it has come to pass, you may, pass, you may believe. I will no longer speak much with you, for the Prince of the world is coming, and in me he has nothing. But he comes that the world may know that I love the Father, and that I do as a Father, has commanded me. This are the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, my brothers and sisters, this Mass is offered for the were the intentions of the Albert family. Uh, this uh, great text on <clears throat> Pentecost from uh, John, I should just throw in a little bit of commentary on the text itself. Um, our Lord says the Father is greater than I. He is not denying his equality with the, the Father and the uh, and the uh, Holy Spirit uh, as, as God the Son, but he's denying it as far as his humanity. He had not yet, when he's speaking, had not yet ascended to his Father. So uh, it's an important point to note because uh, we, there's such a difference between here and where he speaks as a human being who works uh, in the person, in the presence of God, but nonetheless uh, a human being. And then he, he is put aside, as we know, his glory uh, for a while to be among us. And uh, so next time they see him, he would be uh, on his way to his glory and ultimately they would see him after he had already achieved uh, his glory. Uh, and uh, which is, they were given a kind of a 
preview of in uh, at the Transfiguration. So that's what's going on there. Don't let that uh, throw you off. Saint James, Saint Peter, and the Psalms speak often about tongues. When I actually focus a little on tongues, their negative aspects when misused. Gossip, detraction, slander, basically violations of the Eighth Commandment. And uh, St. James particularly talks about the fearsome power that the tongue has uh, to hurt the person's uh, salvation. So the Holy Spirit it brings at Pentecost, he brings into a world a reversal of a misuse of God's gifts, and then, uh, including the gift of speech. Gift of speech is not meant for running down other people, other children of God. The gift of speech uh, is meant for the praise and the glory of God and to, uh, to elevate the souls of our fellow brothers and sisters. So in the epistle, we see that the Holy Spirit starts with tongues of fire. What does fire do? It gives us light. What is that light for the soul? It is truth with a capital T. All sin begins with a lie. All uh, uh, salvation begins with the truth. And so we have the truth. The truth is basically Jesus Christ. Everything we need to know if we knew nothing else except all of what Christ said and did, uh, that would be enough. If we, if we followed it, it would be enough to uh, save us. So it brings us truth. It brings us uh, enlightenment, that is. Secondly, it brings us purification. Fire burns, it purifies. Uh, purifying from what? From our sins and from our, our attachments, our excessive attachments to the things in the world which leads to sin. Thirdly, it gives us warmth. And that is, you could say, an influx of charity, the warmth of charity that uh, fills us uh, with its goodness and also overflows to others. And fourthly, it brings us what I call enlivenment, or you could call it vitality, zeal for your house. Fire makes you want to just and really do something. And uh, so if we get that fire in our souls, then we have zeal for God. Now the matter of speaking in tongues, we see that the Holy Spirit will purify what we hear and what we understand. The various tongues, and remember people are hearing what the apostles are saying, they're hearing it in their own language what the, uh, some of the charismatics and others call speaking in tongues, where they actually try to train you in advance to speak in tongues, meaningless gibberish, or in some language that's unknown, uh, that, is, uh, that is not what speaking in tongues is. That's called glossolalia, and it's meant to try to achieve some experience, but it's very similar uh, in a kind of a scary way, it's very similar to one of the things, one of the signs of demonic possession, uh, which is the ability to speak in tongues that nobody understands. Uh, so uh, uh, what we're talking about, speaking, the really speaking in tongues, is uh, the apostles speaking in their language and the, is being heard by the hearers in their own language. So there's a, a division there in the sense that uh, we, it's purifying what we hear and how we understand it. It's not a sign of dispersion. We remember the Bible tells us that different tongues came as a result of the pride of Nimrod the king uh, way back in uh, early biblical times, or early part of the Bible, where he decides to let's 
put my, all the resources in my kingdom to building a tower to heaven so we can be, or at least he could be, equal to God. Now, of course, uh, nonsensical to us at this point. But the division came as a result of their sin. God, God had it happen to them, but that was a punishment for their sin. But the, the, we see divided tongues here, but that's not the same thing at all. There's not a division of the tongue. The tongues are already divided. We see one Holy Spirit extending to all peoples the invitation to choose uh, and for, to join the unity of the one church, one faith, and one Lord. In the gospel, the kingdom of God or Jesus Christ, we see, is not going to be primarily something you can touch or see. You can't go locate it on a map anywhere. And uh, even though it is true that in the context of our, our humanity living through time and space in this world, where the kingdom of God is, uh, we will co-create with him and we'll also recognize evidences of him in a truly Catholic culture that is art, literature, architecture, all these different things and of course the most beautiful thing this side of heaven as Father Faber called it, the, uh, the, the liturgy of the sacrifice of the mass. All of these things bespeak the order, the truth, the goodness and the beauty uh, of God. And that's why it's really kind of a blasphemy, although people don't usually understand it, when people apply modern art to the mass or to the church buildings and so forth. You want some really interesting examples of that, go up to Baltimore where I was at Dane. Some of the churches there are just ghastly. I don't know what else to call them. Um, yeah, the, the intention, I'm sure, wasn't bad, but the, uh, uh, they're just like vaults of the dead, some of them. So that's, that was from the past. I hope they're getting rid of those nowadays. God's kingdom is primarily, even though it showed itself in Christendom of the Middle Ages and later, God's kingdom primarily is interior what showed in the Middle Ages and the great cathedrals and so forth uh, was the result. It was a symptom of enough people really having God's kingdom within them. Uh, we baptized our, uh, uh, maybe uh, we are preached to, guided and motivated by the Holy Spirit working within us. The Holy Spirit, is uh, within us as, as the Spirit in order that we not be forced but that we be appealed to, to convince us. But there's no compulsion there. And he works within each of those who are willing to look on the body and blood of Christ and name that as God's Son. The Holy Spirit's within us. He will never contradict or change the fundamental teachings of the Catholic Church on faith and morals, including scripture. The Holy Spirit is not a relativist. No person of the Blessed Trinity works without the presence or participation of the other two persons. Therefore, the Holy Spirit as spirit is the way that we have the indwelling Within ourselves, we have sanctifying grace of the Blessed Trinity. And it's also why we must see our union with the church and more broadly through Christ with all people as a real relationship, blood kin, as we would say in this part of the country, a real relationship and not just an idea or an ideal. The Holy Spirit is a soul of the mystical body. The church dwells in the church in intimacy, reaches out to all others to draw, into this, draw them into this sacred marriage uh, with humanity through Jesus Christ. Now, I grew up as a Methodist, uh, 
and my Methodist mother, God rest her, would require me to, always does require me to say this, and it's quite true. Don't tell me the Holy Spirit doesn't work outside of a Catholic church. The Holy Spirit dwells in a unique way within the Catholic church. Well, what's the point of the Holy Spirit besides the sanctification is to pull others who are uh, not entirely uh, in union with us or who are not even Christian at all together as one, together as one. So the Holy Spirit, uh, you can experientially test. There are wonderful non-Catholic Christians out there. But always, while recognizing that, the idea is not to just shake their heads and say, well, really, it really doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit always wants them to come to the Catholic Church, to the one true church, as then Cardinal Ratzinger expressed it, uh, later Pope uh, Benedict XVI. Uh, and it fits exactly with what our Lord says elsewhere. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places or mansions. Tongues of fire of the Holy Spirit reach out and bring all humankind into, one, into the one Catholic Church. And we see in that the principle that the incarnation of Christ, continuing incarnation of Christ in our day, starts with the true presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. And it continues courtesy of the Holy Spirit through all those who look on the body and blood uh, in the Eucharist and see Jesus Christ in his fullness of humanity and divinity. And it speaks truly uh, with their, with their and those who speak truly with their tongues, their praise and love for him. May God bless you. And of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we have <clears throat> two next week will be <clears throat> the solemnity of the uh, Blessed Trinity. And the weekend after that, the Sunday after that, we will celebrate the uh, external solemnity of Corpus Christi. There will be a, uh, a procession uh, to end the Mass and close the Mass with a procession that will carry us out uh, wandering far afield for a while. And there will be a... Um, a dinner uh, after that in the parish center. There'll be some folks doing up some cooking and all. And those things are usually uh, pretty good, so stick around for the chow. Uh, refreshment after walking around in the, in the hot sun. So I uh, hope you're looking forward to it. We'll be training servers for the next two Saturdays and other folks and uh, are really already have been working with some of the other folks uh, to uh, make this a really memorable occasion. This will be the Corpus Christi procession for the entire parish. So, um, yeah, we have a, suddenly we have a leadership position, which is uh, uncomfortable, but uh, it's also a great challenge. God bless you.